Hello, everyone. We're going to get started. I'm Karen. I'm the track host for this session. Just a few reminders. We are going to do Q&A at the end. If you have a question, raise your hand. I will run up with the microphone. And then um, please do help us out by filling out the survey at the end of the session on Sketch. We do value the feedback. And with that, let's get started. Welcome to K3S Under the Hood, building a production grade lightweight Kubernetes distro with Darren Shepard from Rancher Labs. Let's give him a warm welcome. All right. Um, yeah, thanks for everyone for coming out. Um, surprised to see how many people came for being such a late session in the conference. So it's pretty cool. So thank you for, thank you for, uh, coming out. So just a little bit about me, if you don't know anything about me. Um, so I'm chief architect and co-founder of Rancher Labs. Um, I'm best probably known by I Build the Cloud on GitHub and, um, and Twitter. Um, I just complain about things on Twitter. That's basically all I do. Um, so I created K3S and, and a couple other projects at Rancher. And um, basically, I've been in this space for like 15 plus years before doing container orchestration and, and this type of stuff. I was doing IaaS, uh, you know, cloud stack, open stack type stuff. So kind of been doing this for a while. Uh, really enjoy the space, love infrastructure, infrastructure, love orchestration. So just a little bit about me. So, um, so fundamentally, I just want to start off kind of high level about what is K3S. So um, first, you know, what we call it is lightweight Kubernetes uh, or lightweight Kubernetes for the edge. Um, at this point, the use cases have extended well beyond what people are just doing in edge, but it does work perfectly. It's very good for the edge. So basically, it's lightweight Kubernetes, and what that means is uh, uh, it's very small. It's just a single binary. It's about a 50 megabytes. Um, you know, when we first released, it was 40 megabytes. It's grown a little bit. I think it's at like 48 right now. But, um, but so it's about 50 megabytes, about a download. Memory size of a, you know, a single node uh, configuration is about 300 megabytes. So this, this fits, that's for running the full server, you know, the, like the control plane plus the, the, you know, everything you need to you know, run the containers. So it's about 300 megabytes if you're just doing a, a, uh, just the worker nodes, it's less than that. It's more like around 150 or something like that. It's small enough that it runs on a Pi Zero. So somebody was showing me their home automation system running a bunch of Pi Zeros. And so um, basically one of the things about K3S is just like I put in here low cognitive load. It's just, it's really easy to use. And that's what a lot of people, the reason why they like, and I think that's why it's kind of taken off is because it's just really easy to get up and running. Um, so it is perfect for the edge, but it's beyond like we, we decided at Rancher Labs, I'll talk more about the history of this project, but we decided to invest in it because there was an obvious business opportunity for the edge, but but people are using it in just so many different ways, including cloud, um, which we never really planned for. Um, but so it's just used in a lot of different ways that you just, um, we never really imagined. Uh, one of the things that sets K3S apart from other kind of like small distros, let's say like Minikube or Microcates or I don't know, any tiny, like there's tiny, any small word plus Kates, you can probably find a project for it, is like this was very much from the beginning oriented towards production this is not intended to be a developer's tool, like or not or like a toy. Like it, it does work great for development, but it was it was always we wanted something that was production grade. So like on day one when we announced this, it you know was fully CNCF certified. Um, everything's secure by default. We really try to enforce the best practices. We don't want you to have to you know like everything should be secure with uh, certificates and passwords and everything. We really um, don't want you to have to worry about that. Um, and kind of the last thing about it is it's fundamentally it's a Kubernetes distribution. Um, and I, I do really do feel like we're kind of leading the charge on what a distribution of Kubernetes is. Is because um, if you kind of look back like a history of like let's say like Linux distributions, so like way, way back when, so I've been I'm a long time Linux user, I've been running like Linux on my desktop for twenty, you know, twenty plus years or whatever. So it's like the very beginning of, of Linux, it was like just trying to get the thing to install. You know, compile it and get it to run. Like so, a distribution was just helping you just kind of run the thing. And then they came up with package managers because that was a, a, a necessary technology of how do we get all the software on there. And so, in the Kubernetes world, most distributions right now, they're they're not necessarily a package manager, but they're pretty much a um, instead of a package manager, the the corresponding technology would be like it's a deployment tool. So most distributions today are in fact really what they're doing is they're just helping you deploy Kubernetes. 
Um, but what we've done with K3S is it's like, okay, well, there's a million different ways to get Kubernetes. Um, let's actually tailor it for a specific use case. And that was like lightweight, simple. Um, so it's like when you look at the evolution of Linux distributions, it's like they all started to take on personalities of like, you know, Debian was huge open source uh, community. Ubuntu is really easy to use, like Gentoo's for personal space heaters. Um, so <laughs> it's like, so like with K3S, it's like, you know, that's what we kind of feel. It's like, okay, well, there's a lot of different ways to get Kubernetes, but we're going to put together a package of Kubernetes uh, in a very specific way. And it's kind of tailored to how we think it should be done. And if you don't like that, that that's fine. Like, that's cool. Just go use a different distribution. There's plenty of them. Um, okay. So, um, so just kind of like a short history uh, of uh, K3S. So basically, I mean, the project really is just a complete fluke. Like, it was never intended. Like, it was, so basically, this came from, we have a separate project called Rio that we also announced at KubeCon for beta. Um, let me see, right? Yeah. So, um, so when I was developing Rio, like, I, the idea of Rio was just trying to make, like, Kubernetes easier. There's, I mean, there's a lot, I could give a whole talk on Rio, but, like, but when I was developing Rio, I'm like, hey, what if I just bundle Kates inside? So it was like, you don't even have to install Kubernetes. It's like, you just get Kubernetes with Rio. And then, so Rio was this like full package that included Kubernetes. And then we realized we're like, hey, this is like actually the easiest way for us to run Kubernetes. So then we ripped out the Kubernetes portion of it and we're like, just made that as, as a standalone project. But this was just kind of like my own pet project. Um, and then somehow it kind of got picked up because um, everything I do is open source. You can see it, like everything from like a company perspective and also personal is all open source and up on GitHub. And, and you know, people kind of tend to watch what I'm doing on GitHub. And so some people kind of saw this, this project that I was working on and I got a little bit of attention and it was like, oh, well, you know, maybe this is something we should invest in. And then, then um, when we, we finally announced, like decided, you know, to see if there's like a really a business opportunity edge turned out to be like, oh, this is really good for edge. So we decided to put you know, effort into it company-wise, and we announced it in February of this year, and then it just kind of blew up. Um, okay. So just kind of like some vanity metrics. So it's like, the, the, uh, so basically we released the project in February, so that was like nine months ago, if I did my math right, maybe 10. Um, and then so we just GA'd for, for, for KubeCon. Um, so, so it was again, it's like we, we announced it, we really didn't expect the, the amount of attention we would get for it. And so once we, we announced it, then we really had to double down on uh, the amount of effort we put into it to make it what we really thought was production grade. And that's a lot of what this talk is. Like this talk will go, I'm trying to go into really the guts and the details of what we do, have done in K3S so you really understand what it is. Um, but within that time, like we've gotten 10,000 stars, and I'm really excited because we got 10,000 stars about 10 minutes ago. Um, so I've been really like on Twitter, but asking people, I'm like just you know, so yeah. So so this diagram on this right here is actually the blue line is Rancher. That's like our core product that we built our business off of, um, and then K3S is the th is a thing on the side. So it's like basically. Within a, like you know a nine month time frame, we've gotten ten thousand stars, which, which basically took us about five years for our main product. And our main product is like you know what drives our whole business or whatever. So it's pretty exciting for me to like see it take off that quick. I really, really actually want to see K3S cross uh, Rancher, and I really think it will. Hopefully, over the next year, they'll they'll cross. They'll become more popular than our than our management product. Um, so yeah, some other stats. It's, so it's been downloaded, you know, 500,000 times. Poll, image polls, like 700,000. Uh, we're really bad at tracking metrics of like who's actually using it. Live clusters. We really wish we had better metrics on this, but like we guess like around 800,000 nodes have been launched from just kind of inferring from image polls. Um, so so basically, I mean, it just seems to be taking off, uh, which is really cool. So, um, so as I get in and talk about kind of like the architecture and, and everything, we kind of, we separate K3S, like the command line, into two things. We have server and agent. And server, what that means is that's running the control plane, like the API server, the controller manager, and the scheduler. And it's, run, it's also running like a master worker, which is the, cube, the kubelet. So then when we talk about agent, the agent is just pretty much like the kubelet. I mean, cube proxies in there and some other things, but like, so that's kind of uh, when I show these diagrams, kind of how we separate. We that's just the nomenclature we've used as like server and agent. Um, the reason why we, we called it that way is it just kind of seemed it was easy for people to get conceptualize. It's like playing kind of multiple servers, join agents, and whatever. Okay, so what does it look like? The actual like processes, like what are you running? It's like how do we make it so small? 
Um, a lot of it has to do with like, why the memory footprint is so much smaller. It has to do with how we combine processes and how we packaged it. So on the, uh, the left is the, the server, and on the right is on the agent. If you're running this on, um, so the agent would be by itself. If you're running the, the server and the agent together, which that's, that's kind of the default mode of when you run a server, it actually has an agent running too. It's just the agent is embedded inside the server process. So um, on a server, these two boxes on the left, like the box on the left and the box on the right are actually combined into one process. An agent just as the agent portion. Um, so in the server, basically, we combine the API server, the scheduler, the controller manager. We have this tunnel proxy uh, thing running, too. I'll talk about it more in detail what that is. Um, and then uh, we also have some other controllers and some little things running some arbitrary, to just do some arbitrary things like uh, DNS management for the nodes. And uh, we do some tricks to make uh, the nodes uh, you know, n not require like DNS names because right now like Kubernetes kind of the default behavior is every, like the node name is actually a fully qualified uh, uh, name that you can look up. And so we do some little tricks like in controllers and stuff to, to work on that. Um, and then it's also embedded in there is SQLite too. So there's more options around storage. It's not just SQLite and I'll get more into that, that later too. But it's, it is actually one of the large things that makes it so much uh, smaller and lighter weight is the default mode is we just we run in SQLite. So again, if you're caring about like smaller, uh, you know, like an edge use case or like a single node deployment, I don't need like a highly available etcd. Um, uh, but I'll talk about how you achieve HA in the coming slides. Okay, so on the agent side, so basically in when one process, we basically we've included both the cube proxy and and the kubelet and then the tunnel proxy. Uh, and then uh, flannel is actually embedded into the same process. Uh, and then as a child, that runs container D. So by default, we run container D. That's kind of like our preferred runtime, but it is completely swappable. You can run any CRI, but by default, it is, it is container D. Um, so we actually found like th that saves a significant amount of <laughs> memory is actually just combining a lot of these processes. Um, because each process basically has like the full Go SDK in it. It like takes up more, more memory. And so where you're just, if you're looking at like the initial memory footprint for these smaller environments, um, those things kind of matter. Just every Go process is gonna like by default start around like 40 megabytes of memory or 20 meg, you know. So um, just combining them it actually did quite a bit. Okay, so when we get into kind of like deployment architectures, like how do, how is K3S clusters actually, you know, what do they look like? So the obvious simplest one is just a single node. So this is, you know, this is kind of an edge optimized case. Um, so people are, are using K3S uh, in a lot of places just running single node clusters. There's a lot of applications for this of just, I have one computer for, for whatever um, and I'm putting uh, Kubernetes on there. Um, so that's kind of the simplest thing. Okay, so then we have basically like the multi-node non-HA cluster. You have one server, multiple agents. Uh, you know, so that's kind of pretty straightforward. So we also support uh, um, running with an external database. Um, so you have a, a minimum of two servers. Uh, the, in this situation, you don't need a quorum. So you just need two servers, and you can have as many agents as you want, uh, and then a database. And so what that database is, it's either going to be MySQL, Postgres, uh, or etcd. Um, you know, I'll talk more on how, how we accomplish that. Um, so then there's this other mode of basically running, this is like full embedded uh, DB cluster. This is again like an edge optimized use case of like I just have three servers uh, running on the edge I want highly available and I also don't want to run like an external database. So in this mode we're running DQ Lite embedded into the processes. So it's, it's kind of, it's, it's using all the SQLite work we did but then we did DQ Lite. Um, DQ Lite is a really cool project that came from Canonical which is basically they added Raft to SQL, like they use Raft to replicate the SQL, uh, the SQL Lite um, uh, write append log. So they take the, the, you know, like the kind of the change data capture, like the log that's coming out of, out of SQL Lite and then replicate it across all the servers. And so we embed that directly. So you can just launch three, uh, three servers, uh, three servers point them on together. And then in this situation, since it is Raft, you need a minimum of three of them. Uh, you need a quorum. Uh, and so in this situation, you know, you can lose one server if you want to be able to lose two. You need to have a, a cluster of five, you know, just your standard clustering things. Um, 
So it's kind of like, well, how do you set these things up? So this is why people like K3S so much. Is like, it's just ridiculously simple of, of like, how do you run a server? Well, you just run a server and you can uh, put a token in there. What that token means is it's just some arbitrary long random string, string that you're gonna use as a shared secret among the cluster uh, so people can join. So you, like, you launch the server. Um, if you wanna join an agent, you just point to the server, you give it the token, it joins, you now have an agent. If you wanna join a server, uh, you can you just point it to the server. This is for the full EHA mode. If it's if you're not, uh, I'm sorry. This is for the full uh, embedded HA mode. You just point it to another server. It joins the cluster. Uh, then you, you know you've got a, a three node cluster or whatever. If you're using an external database, instead of doing the dash s and pointing to the server URL, you would uh, point it to the you would give it the database credentials and URL, so they could talk to the to the database. Um, but I mean, it's like this is like one of the few talks that I have not that I've done that does not have a demo. I just didn't really. It's like the demo is really just like you run that command and now you have Kubernetes. It's like that's it. It's a couple seconds. So okay, all right. So this is where we like we start getting into the guts of like basically what I want to talk about is like basically what do we modify in Kubernetes to make this happen? Uh, you know, what does that mean? Like you know. Uh, you know, uh, how do we maintain this going forward and all that stuff. Basically, what is all the stuff that we've developed and added on? And then uh, what is additionally packaged? Like, what are the things we're including in K3S? Because um, a lot of times people get just ask me, like, well, how's it better than just QBADM? QBADM's not really that hard to run. You know, once you, you learn it, you, you can run it, you can get a cluster up pretty quickly. Or like, what about like Kind or something? You can get a cluster up pretty quickly. And, and it's like, well, the intention of this talk was basically to show it's like, well, we've done a significant amount of work beyond kind of like what you can just get out of like the basic QBADM. Although a lot of some of the stuff that we've done does overlap with the way QBADM works, and and I would like actually like more synergy there. It's either like we were just naive and didn't realize like we were duplicating effort, um, or we had like legitimate reasons of why we did it different. Um, okay. So basically, like, what are the Kubernetes modifications? This is like the most important thing. It's like it is. This is not a fork of Kubernetes. And it's like, and I kind of understand why some people might think K3S was like we fork Kubernetes, especially if you watch the history of it. Because when I very first announced it out there, I think I, I called it like Kubernetes without the stuff I don't care about. It was like or like I don't like or whatever. I just I just ripped out everything I didn't want out of Kubernetes and just made it work for myself. Um, but the, you know that that's not maintainable or really makes a lot of sense. Um, but so we've really put, so it's like once we announced Kubernetes, um, when we, what, sorry, when we announced K3S in February, so at that time, there was actually over 3 million lines of code that we changed in Kubernetes. Like this was largely 3 million lines of stuff we deleted that, that we like, hey, we just don't want that. Um, but like it took off so quick and people wanted to use it in all these different ways that we never imagined. We're like, okay, well, we really just need to add everything back. Like we need to like it needs like so so we put a lot of effort of like one is like can we add it back and keep it as still simple and small like lightweight as what we had before and then also the things where we do really need to change it like specifically like SQLite for example um, how can we do that in a way that we can actually maintain this going forward is something that we can possibly upstream or create a different component or whatever. So that was like all the effort that we spent. There's two things that we spent from like in the last 10 months um, or nine months was like basically uh, ensuring that it was just like rock solid for like HA scenarios. And the second was that we can maintain this going forward. So that as there's new K Kubernetes releases, there's new CVEs, whatever, we can get things out and we're not maintaining some like crazy weird version of, of Kubernetes because that was never the intention. It was like, you have to, like the way I work is like I'm fundamentally just a hacker. Like I want to get something done, so I'll find the qu quickest route to get something done. But then like, then you realize it's like okay, well if I want to continue this forward, what, how can I maintain it? So that was kind of the initial release of K3S was like we we really modified a lot. But now with 0.11, well actually it's 1.0. I should have updated. So with 1.0, there's really less than a thousand lines of code of Kubernetes that we've changed. Uh, and, and I'll go over like what, what those specifically are. And you can find all the patches that are in Rancher Kubernetes. If you look at, like, when you run uh, K3S, wow, let's see. So when you run K3S, uh, there's a, uh, the, the version of the Kubernetes that comes up for the node, that's basically the tag you'll find in the repo, and you can see all the patches. Okay, I think I'm gonna have to like rush through them. So 
because I have till three. Is that what? Does, does this go till three? Okay, all right. And I want to do some Q and A at the end. So, um, okay. So what did we actually modify? The first thing we did was we added rootless support. Like we didn't do anything. This is like 100%. This all goes to. I hope I don't butcher this. It was Akihiro um, from NTT. Uh, he's done all this work, and it's like it's amazing. And we really care about rootless, and we really want it to work. There's a lot of use cases where it makes sense, so we've carried over those patches. Um, so that's one thing. The other, so, in terms of functionality that we've actually dropped, we dropped all third-party in-tree storage drivers. Um, they add just a tremendous amount of bloat to Kubernetes. Um, so we dropped those. Um, so basically, we focus completely on CSI. So that's like going to be, so this one and the second bullet point is like, people always ask, does it work on K3S? It's like the majority of the time, yes, it will, except for these two points right now. The first is we don't do entry storage drivers. We only support CSI. The second is we dropped cloud providers, but they're coming back. <laughs> but like, they, like, we're just going to do it in a way that we can maintain the, the small footprint. But so we dropped cloud providers and any dependencies on cloud SDKs, because again, this just adds a ridiculous amount of bloat. Um, so those are the main modifications where like we actually changed functionality. It behaves different than the upstream one. And like so this one we hope this the, like these are both things that upstream they're doing the same thing anyways. It's just we jumped the gun. You know, so it's like upstream is getting all the cloud providers out, moving them to external, the drivers are all moving to CSI. So we fully expect that we can be like just over the next year, hopefully, just pull directly what's coming from upstream and, and not, not modify it. So we have some backported, backported bug fixes, just things that we hit or whatever. Um, and then a lot of the changes are just mostly around allowing us to embed, uh, embed Kubernetes into a single process. And we're getting better at this, of finding better ways that we can do this, that anything that we think really should be upstream, we will upstream. But as we look at it deeper, we're like, you know what, we can actually do it this in this different approach. And so we haven't really upstream a lot of stuff here around this um, because we think we can just do it in a different approach and not have to worry, you know, and not ask for changes or anything. Um, so that's really the majority of the Kubernetes modifications. Like, it's really not, not like, so it's less than a thousand lines. <laughs> Okay, now this is like all the things that we've developed. This is where it gets into this really long list. So the first thing is we have a reverse tunnel proxy for the kubelet. So this is like basically the, the way Kubernetes works is we need bi-directional communication to the kubelet. API server talks to the kubelet, kubelet talks to the API server. So from a firewalling perspective, that often causes issues. And so people um, don't want to have to worry about that, that bi-directional communication. And so basically we've modified, uh, we include this tunnel proxy that basically all of the agents make an outbound, like only make an outbound connection to the API server. And then from the API server, we tunnel through that backwards. And so we're able actually to do this all without modifying Kubernetes because we just override the dialers that are used by the, the, cube, the cube clients. Um, so we don't have to modify. It's like kind of, there's already good support for this. This is a, an approach we, we do for Rancher, for our management product. And so we just took that technology, we put it in there. Um, so this just makes people firewall, just little, just the kind of little thing that makes it a little easier to run and not have to worry about um, those things. Okay, so I'm gonna, so the, one of the major changes we did is SQLite. Um, so we actually pulled this out into a separate component called Kine. Because um, initially we were uh, modifying Kubernetes pretty heavily, like we implemented a different storage implementation in Kubernetes. And we're like, well, how can we maintain this? How can we get this upstreamed? Um, and it was very hacky, the way that, that, that we did it. And so we kind of felt like the best approach for us to move forward was, was basically to pull all that out into a separate, a separate process, like, uh, um, project that basically just implements an etcd uh, API and then translate that into the, you know, like whatever we need for Postgres or MySQL. So there's a separate project we created called Kine that basically just exposes an, an, an Etsy a, API. Today we run that all in the same process over like a hidden Unix socket and, um, so you don't see it, but any standard Kubernetes distribution can actually, you can just take that and instead of pointing to etcd, you, you take the same etcd configuration, you point it to kind, and then it can run on any database. Um, this is something we very, very much want to just give to Kubernetes and then help standardize the storage interface of Kubernetes uh, because we effectively just reverse engineer the behavior of how it works to be able to build this. And I'll go more, I have another slide specifically on kind how it works. Um, so also we did DQLite integration besides just the, 
getting kind of the kind component. There's other things with DQ Lite of how to manage the transport, how to do all the security and stuff like that. Um, okay. Um, we also, we, uh, we include a full BusyBox user space. Um, so that includes like IP tables, DU, find, so these are just utilities that, that that, that, K3, that Kubernetes needs, like user space things Kubernetes needs. So all those we package in. So there's actually zero dependency on anything in user space for K3S. It will actually, if you have the mounts of like sysproc dev, uh, K3S will just run. We don't need anything else. Um, K3S is actually a binary, it's, a, it's really just a self-extracting archive. When you run it, the very first step, you'll see it actually creates a directory called data, and that's we, we then put all the these extra components like IB tables and whatnot. So it's packaged as, as one binary, it's ran as one buyer, but in fact it's an archive that has a bunch of stuff in it. So we do a, tons of stuff around certificates that's like a, just a massive amount of effort of like managing the certificates and doing the rotation and um, giving proper you know CNs and everything to all the different uh, components. Uh, just really a lot of work there. Again, we probably overlapped a lot with what, what KubeADM does, but we kind of had to do everything like super like dynamic and um, like no user interaction. Like so, we just kind of automatically do all this stuff. Uh, there's this whole server bootstrap process that also, besides just generating the, the certificates for the server, we also have to figure out how to get the CAs and private keys from one server to another. So there's a whole process of how to communicate and share those things. Okay, more things we did. So we um, we do like just to make it easier to deploy applications. Like once I got Kubernetes running, well, the first thing is like I got I can very easily bring up Kubernetes. How do I make it easy to deploy applications? Like package it really easily. So we have a like a controller that basically just watches a directory that is very similar to like the pod static manifest. Like you just put a Kubernetes manifest in a directory, it'll automatically deploy it. So you can, you can, what you can do is you can have a directory with a bunch of Kubernetes manifests in it. You can have a directory that has like the images too, and then you just run K3S and it comes up with your application, doesn't have to pull anything, it's pretty cool. Um, and then also, since so much stuff uses Helm, we actually have a Helm controller built into K3S, so you can just define a custom resource for Helm. Server boots, I already talked about that. Um, client, we have a client side load balancer that runs for, on the kubelet side because the, like in an HA situation, you have a you know multiple servers, API servers. You need a load balancer between those. So we actually do a client side load balancer. So the client side load balancer it's using Google TCP proxy uh, project, um, but we watch the endpoints, and so we have a controller that's running on the kubelets to kind of do that client side load balancing. So you don't have to in input a load balancer in there too. Uh, we actually wrote a cloud provider because basically the only way you can set an external IP on a node is to have a cloud provider. So we had to implement a cloud provider just to set this one field. Um, but it's actually not that hard to implement a cloud provider. We do an embedded service load balancer. So the service load balancer API will still work. It just basically will uh, do uh, use host ports. Um, let's see. We have a local storage provider. So you have a storage class. Like the idea of K3S is like when you bring it up, it's like all the like, it's like ingress, storage, provider, network policy, like all the kind of additional APIs in, K in Kubernetes, they all work, but all those things require additional components. Well, we made them, like we make sure it's all working, just, you know. So that's stuff that we, we developed. I'm gonna run out of time here. I really wanna open it for questions, so I'm gonna kind of run through this last one. So basically, so these are all the components that we've included in K3S, all again in this like little 50 megabyte. Well, actually, that's not sure. Some of the images are downloaded. So it's 50 megabytes for the binary, and then if you wanna run in a fully air gap situation, we provide a tarball um, of the other images. That tarball decompressed is 250 megabytes. So compressed it, it's probably like another 50 megabytes, or whatever, but that's, you know, that's for like full air gap, and, and so full air gap is supported with K3S. So basically what's included, we compile flannel in, we just basically include it in, and we have support out of the box for VXLAN, IPsec, and WireGuard. WireGuard does require you to bring the user space components though. But for IPsec, we actually include the full strong swan. Um, so IPsec will just work out of the box. Um, we have a network policy controller, we picked this up from Cube Router. I'd actually um, like to, we probably need to work a little closer with the Cube Router project, but we're, so basically you get a network policy controller. Uh, we have container D, run C, all the CNI binaries, strong swan. Uh, we include traffic for ingress, core DNS, everyone's got that. 
what metric server is in there by default now. It took us a while to get like a metric server that worked on all architectures. That's one thing I don't think I ever really called out. This everything that we do runs on ARM HF, ARM 64, and AMD 64. Like we spend a huge amount of time troubleshooting Raspberry Pis. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, you can thank Eric. So one of the lead developers on it is uh, Eric Wilson at Rancher. He spends a huge amount of time. Um, it's there's, uh, Random things just always fail. Um, I also meant, I mentioned the BusyBox stuff before. Oh, yeah, okay, there we go. This all works on those ar architectures. So that's also the thing is, like, we make sure everything works across the architectures. Like, that, but it's a good amount of effort. It was much harder than we thought. Um, I don't really have time to go through all this. Of like, basically, how I could basically do a whole talk on Kine but we've created this other component of how we implemented it's a SQL, uh, how we've implemented the kind of the SQL layer. Um, but again, the idea was we just want to give people options. At CD, like I got nothing against it, but there's situations where people want to run different data stores and there's really good valid reasons for it. Um, so uh, we, this has just been a kind of a pet project of mine for actually probably about four years is really <laughs> understanding how I can implement um, you know, what's required for Kubernetes on a traditional database. Um, and if I'll just call it performance is perfectly fine. We have no issues with the performance. K3S will scale. Actually, even though we target it for these smaller like use cases, K3S scales perfectly fine to thousands of nodes. It doesn't, we have no limitation that we seem to have introduced that makes it any less scalable than uh, regular Kubernetes. The only thing that's different is like you can't separate the uh, API server and the controller manager and the scheduler, those will run in one process. But that doesn't impact scale, but it might you know, impact something else. But I mean, in terms of like how you want to roll out deployments, but we haven't really noticed any problems. So basically, performance is fine. We haven't had any issues. We put it under a huge amount of load. And in theory, um, uh, basically in theory, from what we've seen, Kind should outperform etcd pretty much in every way. Not that it's not that a traditional beta, like not that a database is better than. It's like it's etcd in the context of Kubernetes. How Kubernetes uses etcd, um, a traditional database should be able to outperform it. Etcd itself has some like interesting characteristics where they can do like writes really really fast, but but in the context of Kubernetes, it, it changes everything, and so uh, things have looked really good. Um, let me see. Okay, so basically, it's like, where are we going with this? It's, it, I mean, the easiest thing to say is, it's like, we're just going to expand K3S to support more uh, use cases, because people just want it, kind of, in a lot of different places. We just never intended, um, and we really want to expand like the ecosystem of also like applications and stuff that are just very easy to install on K3S. So there's a couple projects I just want to call it. I can't. I don't have the time to cover them, but basically, there's like K3D, which is really cool for development. If you want to use K3S in a development environment, check out K3D. Um, there's this project K, uh, well, it's Ketchup, but it's 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 spelled uh, K3S up, um, and this is for basically remotely deploying and uh, easily setting up. So if I have a, a you know a cluster of Raspberry Pis, whatever, I can just really easily bring them up. Um, some really cool things there. This Sibo uh, Cloud is actually doing a managed service for K3S, which is a really cool story of like. Basically, you know, um, it was just so easy for them to run K3S. Like, hey, why don't we just offer it managed? Um, so that has been, been pretty cool. Um, yeah, and that leads us to the end, and I probably can answer like one or two questions before we run out of time. So, all right. All right. Maybe let's do one question, and then you can do questions outside after. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We'll just see if we've got a burning question. Who do you want to pick? Yeah, we'll go, we'll go here. Okay. You, you get the questions. Uh, short one. Do you support mixing architectures in one cluster? Can I attach Raspberry Pis to X? Yeah, yeah. Because that's just like a regular Kubernetes thing. So heterogeneous architectures and everything that works fine. Yeah. OK, well, so if anyone has any questions, feel free. Like, um, I guess I'll, I'll kind of head out to the side. And you can come up to me and ask me any questions. But thank you so much for coming. <laughs>